cars and the cyber uh, security threats that we have, and uh, I'll briefly touch about some, on some uh, solutions as well. So before I begin, I'll talk a little bit also about uh, what we do at, at Synopsys. So uh, in the introduction, I've been working with OEMs and suppliers uh, globally, and we actually started uh, with the hardware side of it. So if you look at Synopsys uh, from 1986, we started with the EDA, Electronic Design Automation. So tools to design ICs and chips. Uh, then we continued with the IP, intellectual property for hardware. So anything from USB, HDMI to uh, uh, hardware uh, accelerators, crypto accelerators. And then we, we invested heavily in security. So over a billion dollar investment in security. And in, in 2014, uh, we focused, uh, started our focus on so software. So we started a software integrity group and looking at the software development processes, the tools you need, the services that you need to have a more safe and secure software development. So looking at this combination from hardware and software, it brings us to uh, something new, AI. We talked about uh, machine learning. And also there are new vertical applications, such as for automotive. So that brings me to the agenda today. I want to talk about self-driving cars. I'm saying that they're already here. They're here, but what are the risks? So we'll talk about that as well. And then finally, we'll go into some of the cybersecurity threats. So let's talk about what self-driving cars are here today. So this is the Dark by Grand Challenge from 2005. It's the second one that they held. The first one was in 2004. There were 21 vehicles that took part in that contest. They had to drive 212 kilometers in the desert. And these were all driverless autonomous vehicles. How many of those vehicles do you believe reached the goal? So the first year, there were no vehicles. Uh, the, uh, the best one actually only managed to go 12 kilometers, and then it got stuck on a, on a rock <laughs> and couldn't continue. So the second year, 2005, everyone came back. They learned some lessons from the previous year. Uh, we had, again, about 23 teams participating. And here's actually the winner from Stanford University. So they finished the course in less than seven hours, maneuvered various tunnels and over 100 sharp right turns, left turns, all uh, with no driver. But this was not the first time Stanford was involved in developing a, an autonomous vehicle. So you, if you go back uh, more than 40 years, 50 years from that DARPA challenge, in 1961, Stanford developed this Stanford cart. It has a camera on it, and it could uh, well, autonomously move around obstacles. And this was their first uh, autonomous vehicle. So if we look at what a vehicle is, what kind of components we have, some of you may know this already, but we have these small devices called ECUs, electronic control units. And in a vehicle, you would have maybe 100, 150 units like this and they serve different purposes in the vehicle. So if we look at what kind of domains we have, you would have anything from powertrain, so this will be your engine, transmission, and then you have your chassis, which would be your brakes and steering. You have the body ECUs, anything from instrument clusters, the doors, uh, lighting, and then you would have uh, typically, uh, this is a uh, central gateway architecture here, but you would then have, uh, for example, your external interfaces. So you have your telematics ECU, you would have your infotainment ECU, and also here you would have various interfaces uh, for your audio, video, uh, USB, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and so on. And then up here in the top left corner, we would have your ADA system, your advanced driving assistance systems, which would include various camera sensors and also your autonomous uh, driving ECUs. 
So if we take a closer look at those systems, what kind of cameras and sensors do we have? So cameras, we already know, it's basically what the human would see, more or less. So we can use this to see speed signs, we can detect uh, cars in front of us, the lanes. But you have some limitations, uh, sunlight, uh, when it's dark, for example. So we have LiDAR, it's also mentioned in the previous presentation. Uh, you can use this to shoot you know, laser beams and you build a 3D map. It works well in various weather conditions, uh, also when it's low light. Uh, it's much more precise than radar. But during heavy rain or fog, it doesn't work as well. So you would use radar. Radar uh, has been used for a long time, so you can use this to bounce radio waves and especially to detect, detect big metallic objects such as vehicles. And then you have ultrasound, typically for your short distance uh, detection. So when you do parking, for example, you can use that to detect people or uh, other obstacles. Another important topic here are uh, maps. So to do a, a good autonomous driving, you often also need to know where you are on the map. So you would use a high definition map. Uh, it could be down to like a centimeter level really know where you are, getting information from the sensors and verifying that that is correct with the map. And then finally, GPS. This also helps you uh, localize the vehicle to, uh, to the environment. So if we take a close look at how these cameras and sensors work, you could have more than 10, 15 cameras and sensors on a vehicle. So ultrasound, as I mentioned, would be the short distance, typically used for park assist, you would have your short range radars uh, in the back for, for example, blind spot detection, uh, rear collision warnings, cross traffic alerts. You would have your, uh, your cameras uh, typically around to detect uh, traffic signs. You would have it for your rear view park assist. And then you have, have your LiDAR for the 3D map. Use this more for collision avoid avoidance. Uh, emergency braking, pedestrian detection. And typically you also have this long range radar for adaptive cruise control. And then finally, as I mentioned, the map and the GPS uh, helps you uh, identify a precise location on where you are. So using all this information, uh, we can then uh, use the vehicle to have the vehicle drive by itself. And in doing so, at the SAEJ 3616 uh, define six levels of automation. So uh, some of you may know these already, but I'll just briefly go through them. So level zero, this is the no driving automation. This is basically what you do today with your um, older vehicles. It means you have to have your hands on the, on the steering wheel, your feet on the, on the pedals, you have to have your eyes on the road, and obviously your brain has to be on to process what's happening. Level one, this is uh, what we call driver assistance. So typically one critical function is taking over by the car. So you can imagine that you have an adaptive cruise control, so you don't have to work the pedals anymore. Or you could have a lane uh, keep system that allows you to have your hands off. Level two, uh, this is what you have now today with the Tesla Autopilot, for example or the GM Super Cruise. Um, and this would be that you can have your hands off, feet off. So for a determined uh, route, the vehicle can take control of acceleration, braking, and also steering. But it's under certain conditions. So what we want to go to then is level three, which is the conditional driving automation. Here we go one step further to also make sure that the driver doesn't have to uh, fully observe what's happening all the time. We call that eyes off. The risk here is, of course, that uh, if something happens, something unpredictable that the vehicle cannot handle, the vehicle will give immediate control back to the driver. So even if you have your eyes off, the driver has to constantly be ready to take over any situation that the vehicle cannot handle. So this is quite dangerous uh, because 
a driver may put too much trust into the vehicle by not looking at the road, and then suddenly you have to take over because there's a pedestrian or something else happening on the road. Uh, Audi is working on, on, uh, on this for the A8 uh, sedan that's coming out, uh, but a lot of the other OEMs are considering skipping this level because it is a bit risky. So they're moving straight to level four. This is the high driving automation. For example, Google uh, Waymo's test cars are using level four. Here you have hands off, feet off, eyes off, and also brain off. This means that the driver doesn't have to think about taking off control, they can sit back and relax. If uh, an un unpredicted situation occurs, the vehicle will ask the driver to take over, but if the driver is not available, the vehicle will handle the situation by slowing down and coming to a halt in a safe manner. So the big difference there from level three is that even if the driver is not responding, the vehicle should still be in a safe state. And then finally, the, the goal that we're all aiming for is level five. So level five is the full driving automation. Here is basically driver off. This means that typically the driver would not have a way to take over control. These vehicles would not have a steering wheel. They wouldn't have the, the pedals. You would only have the seats in there. So the driver will not be able to uh, drive the vehicle anymore. So this will be a fully uh, complete uh, autonomous vehicle. So if we look at the timelines, when do we expect to see these vehicles? So we know that some we already have, so level zero, level one, um, these are the adaptive cruise control, for example. And then level two, we also already have with the Tesla Autopilot, some of the parking assist systems. Level three, this is the one I mentioned with the Audi coming out uh, with their A8 sedan. Um, and then we have level four, where we expect this will happen in 2020, 2025. And then final level five, we expect this to happen sometime between 2025 and 2030. So these are the expected timelines for the self-driving cars. Obviously, there's going to be different levels of automation you can expect on the vehicles in the different regions. Um, in some places where the roads are better and the environment is better, it might be easier to deploy these vehicles. In other regions where you have maybe very congested traffic or there's no clear traffic lanes, it might be harder to deploy these vehicles. So let's take a look at a couple of examples of autonomous vehicles that already exist now. Uh, this up here is the Volvo truck, it's called Vera. Uh, it can, you can attach a trailer to it and it will be able to drive around and drop this off. Um, this is how it will look like without the trailer. As you can see, there is no space for any driver in here. Uh, there are no steering wheels or anything like that. This vehicle will drive around uh, delivering these trailers between like inventory stations and different storage locations. This up here is a, uh, a shuttle bus uh, deployed in Stockholm. It's also autonomous. You can just ride in it. Uh, again, these are often like slow speed vehicles at this point and going through some predetermined routes. Uh, this down here is a driverless tractor from John Deere. So also you can have these kind of vehicles in agriculture uh, help you with the harvest or help you uh, with construction uh, by having no driver and no one that needs to control the vehicle, but design how the vehicle should move according to a map, for example, and then you can do all the harvest uh, with these vehicles. So next one here is uh, Navia. I think some of you may know this. Uh, this is also a self-driving shuttle bus. It's been deployed in uh, Las Vegas. I think it's also deployed here in Singapore. And uh, as you can see, it doesn't have any steering wheels. You can just go in and ride it. I was also recently in the U.S. and uh, I was taking a Lyft, so I use I used to use Uber. I switched to using Lyft now, and when I called for a ride, it said that he masked me with a self-driving vehicle. Um, I thought it was a bit experimental, so I actually rejected that ride. 
but uh, I think it's interesting that they're trying this with, uh, with passengers who are interested in trying this. So let's talk a little bit about the risks. So some of these risks are common for vehicles today, but still related to uh, self-driving vehicles. So privacy is one, we have sensitive information, um, we can track where these vehicles go. Operation, so obviously we don't want these vehicles to have an incorrect operation or fail, or get the wrong information from their surroundings. And then lastly, safety. So you can imagine for safety, uh, if this vehicle was a, a self-driving vehicle, and uh, the map and the location was off by 10 meters, this car would believe it's driving on the road when it's not. So these are examples where you can have safety impacts as well. So I'll briefly cover these three in more detail with a couple of uh, news articles. So first, uh, about privacy. As I mentioned, basically because the car has to drive, it knows where the car is, where it has to go, where it has been. All this information could be available. You could also know who's in the car because you have uh, facial recognition cameras that can see who's the driver, who's the, who else is in the car. We have microphones in the car so you can listen in to the conversation in the car. And also we have all the sensor data. So you can imagine again the cameras being used in the car. If I drive up to my house and all these cameras are taking pictures of my house, who owns those images? Can they be used for something else? And there are examples where you can imagine that the self-driving car, um, let's say I'll, I, I want to go and have a cup of coffee. So I'll tell my car, uh, take me to a coffee shop. And then the co coffee, or sorry, the car could then suggest me to go to Starbucks and drive me there. But you can imagine that being like a Google-sponsored ad where Starbucks have paid that car to take me to Starbucks rather than taking me to a closer coffee shop because it knows where I am and can give me some sponsor information. So this all information could be shared, it could be sold, it could be stolen or leaked. So we have examples of uh, Google and Facebook selling these personal profiles for up to $20 each. Uh, we also saw in, this is a bit older data, but in 2012, there was about half a billion in revenue from selling personal information. And if you can collect a lot more information now from cars, this, value, this information will be very valuable. And then recently there was also a breach uh, at Facebook, and they said that 14 million accounts had personal data stolen. So you can imagine again if there's a breach at, uh, at the OEM or the backend server, and how many accounts or how many car, uh, cars will be affected. I'll give you another example of incorrect operation here. So this was in March this year where the Uber car, uh, the self-driving car, hit a pedestrian um, and it was a fatal accident. What happened here was actually that the car, uh, the sensor detected that there was a pedestrian there, but the logic decided that it was a false positive and ignored uh, the fact that it was a pedestrian and decided just to continue and hit that person. So if we look at some statistics of these accidents uh, involving self-driving vehicles, we see that about 35% are based on hardware and software discrepancies. We have about 34% due to perception and sensor fusion mistakes, and then we have about 31% due to wrong decisions. And these are examples where the sensors might be correct but the decision logic is wrong. Or we have situations where the sensors are incorrect, they don't detect the pedestrian, and we saw some examples in the previous presentation too. So we have all these different cases where we need to think of how do we improve this uh, incorrect operation. And lastly, uh, safety-related security attacks. I think most of you are aware of these already. So we had the GPAC 2015, where Chris Velasek and Charlie Miller remotely um, hacked into the Jeep and took control of the steering and the braking. And we also have the Tesla uh, attacks from 2016. This also shows that you can take over the vehicle, take over the steering and braking, affecting safety, 
And with self-driving cars, obviously, you would be able to do the same. So let's take a quick look now at some of the cybersecurity threats. And we talked about the machine learning in some of the previous uh, presentations today, so I'll focus on that topic. So as most of you know already, there are two phases here. You have the training phase, where you have your training data and maybe some labels. So this could be, if you imagine, uh, the stop signs or the speed limit signs and then the labels being stop or 50 kilometers, so 100 kilometers and so on. And you use this to, to learn and basically create a model of this. And then the second phase would be the actual application of this. So you have the prediction. You would have the new data. So this would be when you're out driving and this new data will be the stop signs or the speed signs that you see. You would take that model that you build in, in your learning phase and apply that to make the predictions whether this is a stop sign or a 50 kilometer sign or a 100 kilometer sign. So if you look at what kind of attacks we have here, we'll talk about three types of attacks. So one is attacking the training data itself. And the second one is attacking the model. And the third one being what was presented earlier today, attacking the new data or the adversarial examples. So we're gonna go through these one by one and briefly explain what they are. I won't go into the details. Um, I think that was covered very well by the, the previous presenters. But I just wanted to briefly show what these could look like. So we'll start with the first one, attacking the training data. So what you do here is basically you attack the integrity of the model. So when you train your model or create your model, you want to attack how that model should behave. So to do so, you would need access to the training data or the model so that the attacker can inject whatever values that they want and how they want to change the behavior of the model. So this here is an example of using a driving simulation software and what they did here was they added some training data, uh, basically a Trojan trigger here, so that when this vehicle now sees this billboard, it will make a turn to the right. So this happens that whenever it sees this, this specific billboard or this symbol here, it would always turn to the right. And in this case, it will just uh, crash. So this is not attacking the existing logic in the vehicle, uh, but attacking the model uh, initially so that it will behave in a different way, and then that is being exploited. The second attack is uh, on the confidentiality of the model. So you imagine here that you train, use your training data, you create this model. Uh, this model could be very valuable and you can imagine competitors being interested in getting access to this model and getting that IP. So you wanna steal this learning model. And I'm gonna give one example here of a model inversion attack uh, of a facial recognition system. So this is the image that was used in the training data. So this is a, uh, this person will then go up to the system. It will then be able to identify this person with his name and so on. And what we can do as an attacker is feed this model with random data, if you will, and based on the response we get back, if this system detects this person or not, we can determine if this image is close enough to be accepted as this person. So we will bombard the system with a bunch of images that, and then classify which of these give us a result that system accepted it and thus being able to recreate the model. So in the end, we get this reconstructed image. Now, it's not perfect, but it, it gives us an understanding of this is how the model would classify this person. And if there's people here um, in the study, you had about 80% of these faces being recognized, uh, even though the images are a bit distorted. 
And last, I'm going to do the third attack, which is attacking the integrity of the prediction function. So this is what was presented in the previous presentation, so I'll, I'll briefly just cover this. So we have these uh, adversarial examples, and we basically do perturbations to the images to mislead the function. So again, I think most of you have seen this. You can have your uh, traffic signs, speed limit signs, by changing a little bit of the contrast or changing the images a little bit. They can be detected as uh, different values. And what's also interesting is if you have these spatial recognition systems, so for example, this is uh, Mila Jovovich. I'm not sure if everyone knows that is, but she was in the Resident Evil movies. Uh, so if you have a system that recognizes her, and by wearing these uh, specifically crafted glasses, uh, this person would also be detected as Mila Jovovich. So there are examples like this. If you just add something to it, um, and we saw in the previous presentation too, adding these stickers or changing the images slightly, you can trick this uh, prediction function. So lastly, I want to talk a little bit about solutions. I actually did put a question mark up here because I think right now we, we do have some challenges here. Uh, there are no strong defenses currently known for these type of attacks. Uh, I want to cover again these three uh, issues we have with the attacks. So the first one being, it's very hard to verify and sanitize the training data. You can imagine for these self-driving cars, you have the supply chain, you need to have this data being provided by someone, it's being used for the testing and for the training, and at some point this data might get poisoned someone might be able to modify it or inject something else that they shouldn't do. And then the second challenge here, by stealing the model, because it's included in the vehicle, the attacker has access to the vehicle, it's hard to protect it. I can again spoof a number of images to the vehicle, see how the vehicle reacts. When does it activate the collision warning system? When does it activate emergency brakes, when does it activate detection of the do not enter sign. And based on that, I will be able to reconstruct the model. And then last, uh, the adversarial examples. Because we're driving out in the world, the whole environment is open for an attacker to modify. We cannot protect the environment in that way, so it's hard to stop an attacker from changing Trapping signs or other uh, things in the environment. So I'll end with this takeaway that we really need more secure research in this area. And I would urge anyone who has ideas, who's interested in this area, uh, to definitely uh, do, do research and come up with some solutions. Uh, we really need this to make sure we would have more safe and secure cars in the future. So with that, I'd like to conclude my talk. I want to thank everyone for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Question? No question for self-driving cars. <laughs>